the title for the webinar today, Customer Ghosting, What to Do When Customers Disappear. Um, really exciting topic we're glad to be able to bring to you guys. I think every retail business loves to see loyal customers coming back and uh, coming back again and again. But what do you do when they don't come back? And do you even realize when they don't come back? Um, for a lot of retailers, bringing back lapsed customers is one of the biggest growth opportunities that they have in front of them. In fact, one of the case stories that we're going to feature today is about a 30 unit regional chain here in the West. And when they added up the growth opportunity from lapsed customers, they came up with a number that was close to $36 million a year. So for a medium sized business, that's a pretty significant upside opportunity. Uh, the challenge for a lot of businesses that are operating brick and mortar locations is that identifying lapsed customers um, because you don't necessarily have a record of visit behavior can be really difficult. And, and if you are able to identify lapsed customers, targeting them specifically with an appropriate message that will be effective at bringing them back without necessarily spreading discounts and other kinds of offers to customers who are gonna remain loyal anyway uh, can be a really big challenge. So that is the topic that we're gonna to cover today. Uh, we have a couple of experts and a life case story that we're going to share in order to uh, um, provide some learning. So on to the speakers for today. Um, we have Dom Wong. Uh, Dom is the head of growth at Zenreach. Uh, Zenreach is the, in, uh, the inventor of walkthrough marketing uh, that uses Wi-Fi and other in-store data sources in order to understand customer visit behavior and improve the effectiveness of, uh, of digital marketing. We also have Jessica Shukowski. Jessica, I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher that name just a little bit, a couple of times probably. Uh, but Jessica is the marketing communication specialist at Patronix. Patronix, I think most everyone on the line is probably aware, is a, a leading provider of loyalty and customer experience management solutions for restaurants and convenience store brands. So with the introductions, um, just a couple of details along the way. I don't imagine this is anybody's first webinar, but this is, uh, you guys are on um, uh, muted phone lines. You're able to listen to the conversation, but not able to talk to us. So the effect of the best way to get us questions and comments is to send them through the question box that's in the console uh, or um, use the chat box that's available there. We are recording the session, just so everyone is aware, and that will allow us to make the session available to everybody who's registered for the webinar. So with that said, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Dom, who's gonna open the session for us today. Awesome, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, so as Mike talked about today, we're gonna talk about uh, what to do when your customers ghost you. And, uh, you know, the, I think the interesting stat that we found within this space is uh, for brick and mortar retailers, over 60% of customers come in once and never come back. Um, you know, a lot of our businesses that we work with spend a lot of money acquiring these new customers. But the reality is that the brick and mortar, you know, food and beverage retail space is a super crowded space. And to gain an edge, you truly need to be top of mind uh, even amongst the customers that have been into your store before. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, the low hanging fruit and being able to retain your customers by uh, being able to understand who they are. Great. So today we're going to talk through this framework over here on how you can actually bring back your customers uh, if you're a physical retailer. And we wanna talk about a four step process. Um, step one is being able to know who your customers actually are. So uh, being able to collect their contacts and be able to track their visit behavior. Um, step two, we're gonna talk about how you conduct targeted reacquisition based on um, the customers that you've collected. Part three, we're gonna talk about how you actually measure, measure campaign performance uh, that, that and, and optimize on um, these outcomes. And then part four, we're gonna talk about how you converse uh, lost customers into loyal customers. And throughout this framework today, um, we're gonna be deep diving into these sections. And um, we're gonna actually use a, a case study from a real client of ours. Uh, we fictionalized the name um, for the purpose of this webinar. 
Uh, but we're going to share some true stories with you on how we've actually been able to help businesses uh, bring back their lost customers. Great. So step one is to actually know who your customers are. And that's something that has been a struggle for brick and mortar retailers uh, for quite some time. Now, if you contrast that to the online world, you know, if you're an online retailer today, it's super easy for you to understand who your customers are and build that CRM. And that's because it's common practice for people to enter their email or their address or their credit card when they're making a purchase online. And signing up for a website or if you're an online retailer is a common practice. Now, that's not the same in the real world, right? In the real world, there's not a common practice of entering your contact information when you walk into your local bakery or, or your local restaurant. And until recently, there haven't been many frictionless ways to do it. And furthermore, uh, while online websites have things like cookies and are able to track visit behavior, uh, traditional ways of collecting information in the past, such as comment cards uh, for restaurants, um, had been lacking that capability to understand visit behavior. So even if they are able to collect customer contact information, like an email, um, they can't track visits, right? Um, so therefore, it's really important for real world, real world businesses to be able to do both, you know, collect that contact information, but also understand visit behavior. And today I wanna to briefly talk about you know, three high level ways and we'll deep dive into uh, what we know best uh, through Wi-Fi. Um, so the first over here you'll see on the left-hand side is uh, point of sale. Um, so uh, within the POS, uh, you know, you're actually able to collect emails through customer receipts. Um, second, you're also able to collect customer behavior, customer information through loyalty programs. Um, so things like Patronix, for example, are a great way to have your loyal customers actually sign up for an application, collect their contact information, and then subsequently track their visits based on things like check-ins. Um, and then third, you're also able to use things like guest Wi-Fi, uh, in which um, you're able to broadcast a free Wi-Fi portal and collect guest information as they log into your Wi-Fi and detect their visit behavior passively uh, through Wi-Fi things. And at ZenReach, um, the primary method that we use to collect customer information is through Wi-Fi. So I'll talk briefly about Wi-Fi as a solution here. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, if you're a brick and mortar retailer or a food and beverage restaurant, it's almost become an expectation that you provide Wi-Fi to your guests. Now, one thing you can do is turn that uh, Wi-Fi access point into a actual customer contact collection page. So I'm sure all of you have uh, been into a cafe where uh, one of those guest portals pop up and you can use that to capture customer identities and capture their customer email and in exchange the customer receives free Wi-Fi. And what you can do on the background is actually tie that identity, so tie that email to the device. Now, each Wi-Fi enabled device is able to, uh, ha has a, live signal uh, that broadcasts a unique MAC address every 30 seconds. And once you actually tie that email identity to that device, you can then subsequently track visits even if that person doesn't log into Wi-Fi again. So the beauty is you capture the customer contact information, like you mentioned before, step one. And then step two, you're actually able to track their visit behavior subsequently uh, throughout their customer journey. Now, I wanna jump into uh, a case study and talk about how one of our clients, uh, Mario's Bakery, was able to actually follow these steps and effectively acquire lost customers. Um, now, some background again on Mario's Bakery. Uh, they have 30-something you know, locations within the San Francisco Bay Area, and they have many locations nationwide. Um, but prior to using Wi-Fi and loyalty as a means to collect contact information, um, they really weren't doing too much with customer contact collection. Now, within, as of two years ago, they, they began uh, collecting customer contact information uh, through both Wi-Fi and customer loyalty. And within the Wi-Fi piece alone, they were, almost, they were able to collect nearly a million customer contacts within two years. Uh, that equates to 1,300 customer contacts today. And just through Wi-Fi signals, uh, we were able to detect nearly 7.5 million identifiable customer visits per year for them. 
Now, the beauty of this is not only have they been able to build up a customer database of nearly a million people and allows them to actually target them on a one-to-one -one basis, they're also able to understand a lot of interesting things about the visit behaviors of their customers. Uh, so for example, uh, they're able to understand the distribution of visits amongst, amongst each visitor, as you can see here. 41% uh, of their visitors come in once and never come back. So it's higher than the average um, as they're a highly recurring business. Uh, you know, we can pull demographics based on that. Uh, but again, I think the, the main point here is once you're able to track visit behavior, you can actually understand a lot of really interesting information about your customer and begin segmenting them, segmenting them based on their visits. Great, so step two, you know, once you've actually collected all this customer information and their visit behavior, the next step is to be able to segment them and figure out who your lost customers actually are, right? So again, we're talking about how do we uh, reacquire customers that ghost you, and you have to figure out who the ghosts are right now. And before we dive into the actual segmentation, uh, I wanna talk about the three key methodologies for how you might wanna reach these customers once you have their identity. So the beauty is once you have their contact information, uh, you're able to reach these individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. So you can truly personalize your communication based on each individual's visit behavior. Now, the three ways I wanna talk about pretty quickly are email notifications and digital ads. So email is great because once you grab your customer email, it's a very cost-effective way to reach customers. Now, you know, obviously you're beholden to the open rates of these emails and there are certain customers that respond very well to email marketing and some that you know, might not actually uh, check these emails on a constant basis. Second, notifications. Notifications are great because you can actually, uh, again, very cost-effective um, and you can actually customize these based on app behavior, uh, which can make it very targeted. Um, and then third is digital advertising. You know, while it's a more expensive medium than the, the prior two, um, the great thing is that you can reach people uh, on different mediums and reach people that might not open your emails or might not open some of these notifications um, by putting them on places that they typically browse, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Google, and really geofence that as well. Great. So. Next up, I want to dive into actually building these audiences and figuring out who your lost customers are. Um, so over here, back to our case study of Mario's Bakery, what we did before we launched any lost customer campaigns for them was we actually dove into their customer base today and looked at their visit data to understand who their lost customers uh, are. And the great thing is with this visit behavior that I talked about before, you can segment your lost customer base in the following way. Um, so what you're looking at here is the total number of lost customers uh, at Mario's Bakery uh, within 2019. The first thing here is to, to define what an actual lost customer is. And this is something that Jessica will talk about a little more later on how you determine uh, what frequency to set that lost customer as. Um, but over here, we determined that uh, a lost customer from Mario's Bakery is someone that hasn't come in in 30 days. Mario's Bakery is a fairly highly trafficked location and uh, people come in fairly frequently. And over here, what you see is all the customers that have come in within 2019, but have not been into a single Mario's, back to a Mario's Bakery location within 30 days. Uh, you see in the first column, you have folks that have come in one time and never come back, you know, nearly a million of those. You have 400,000, what we call frequent visitors that have come in two to nine times this year. And then you have the loyal customers, nearly 68,000 of them um, that have come in over 10 times, the average here is actually 18 times, that have suddenly uh, ghosted and haven't been back for, for at least 30 day period. Um, so once you're able to lay this out, you're able to actually visualize who you should target and weight your spend accordingly. So just, so just kind of a follow on question here, Dom. I mean, you said Jessica's going to talk a bit about this later on, but this 30 day period that you're using as the definition of a lapsed customer, is, is there anything magic about that period? How, how did you guys arrive at 30 days? Yeah, totally. Jessica will talk about this a little, little later on. Um, but what you want to do is look at the average visit frequency of uh, your customers and base your uh, lost customer definition off of that. 
And depending on the frequency, you're going to tier different types of offers along the way. Uh, in this case, the 30-day wave was actually what we're going to call our first touch point. And what we'll see in the next slide is that we actually didn't put out an offer. Um, we want, you know, as, as the loss period gets larger and larger, you want to be more aggressive with offers. And that's something we'll cover uh, in the later section. Great. Um, so, you know, looking at all this and all that information, what we determined was that the lost customer reacquisition opportunity represented a $36 million opportunity for Mario's Bakery. Now, this is taking a look at all their lost customers and saying, hey, what if we were able to get them to do exactly what we were doing before and re-engage them uh, in that exact business behavior? How much revenue would that be? And, you know, we determined um, 36 million uh, was the, the size of the prize given the amount of lost customers that we were seeing and able to identify. And based on this audience data, what we did was we actually ran a digital advertising campaign for them to actually bring back these lost customers. So uh, based on that lost customer pool, we pulled the top 150,000 lost customers uh, that hadn't been back for 30 days. And we weighted them based on lifetime value. So those that were more valuable, uh, we weighted more spend behind them and did that accordingly across $16,000 worth of initial spend. Now, the second piece was we actually used Facebook and Instagram as our initial channel. Uh, reason being is that we wanted to be able to get in front of customers as they were walking in around these different Mario Bakery locations. And uh, we were able to use geotargeting to do that. Now, again, I wanna point out here that with this uh, first wave of uh, advertising, we actually didn't put in the offer there. We were actually promoting a new menu item for them, uh, specifically these new cinnamon rolls and almond milk that they were having. So you, you mentioned geofencing, right? So you're able to target people geographically in proximity to the store that were participating in the program. But I'm kind of, I'm, the, the magic here, right, is that you were somehow able to discreetly target people who had been into one of these locations but not been back for a period of time. How, how, I mean, that seems kind of, how, how do you how do you guys do that? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. Um, so for, for those that might not be as familiar with uh, Facebook targeting, really there's, there's two ways you can target people. One is if you actually know their identities, you can actually target those people directly by uploading their emails into Facebook as a platform and uh, impressing those people as they come into your geofence. Um, or second is you can uh, use that data that you have to find new customers through lookalike audiences. Now, for the purpose of today's discussion, we're talking about lost customer targeting. So again, you're totally right, Mike. The value is knowing who these customers exactly are so that you can target them directly uh, with that information and that you're not wasting ad spend targeting, you know, a broad audience uh, based on, you know, broader filters. Great. So what we did was we actually ran that campaign uh, for 30 days and we targeted each of these lost customers at a fairly high frequency um, to get them to come back in. Now, the next step is to actually be able to measure and optimize your outreach. And I think this has always been a pretty tricky problem within this space. Uh, you know, if we think back to Mario's Bakery, you know, they have a national digital team as well. And the main way they were measuring uh, campaign success before was through clicks and post engagements. Um, and as an offline retailer, that's traditionally all you've been able to do where, you know, you get all these impressions on, serve all these impressions on different digital mediums. Um, but you're really only able to measure things based on how many people liked your post and engaged and commented. Um, now, the beauty of knowing who your customers are and being able to identify and track their visit, visit behavior is that you can actually tie that information to digital outreach to actually understand, you know, hey, did Mike see the ad and did Mike actually walk in? And this is super valuable um, because you're actually able to measure for the first time uh, what your cost per walkthrough is, right? And again, if you have this transaction data, this visit data, you're able to actually measure in-store walkthroughs and purchases. And, you know, one other important thing here is 
not only is it important to measure the effectiveness of your advertising, but you need to know which segments it's resonating for because that allows you to then optimize your uh, outreach in the future. Now, I wanna show you some data uh, from Mario's Bakery's campaign as well. And over here, you're looking at the, uh, the distribution of ad impressions on Facebook versus Instagram. Now for this campaign, we, we ran ads on both platforms, but we spent 40% of our spend on Facebook and 60% of our spend on Instagram. And if you were to measure things using, using the old measure of success, which would be clicks and engagements, um, you'd actually see a pretty interesting story where only 20% of the engagements came from Facebook and nearly 80% of it came from Instagram. And based on this, you would think that Instagram is the more effective platform uh, if you're using old ways of measuring success. Now, what's super interesting is actually when you tie this to in-store walkthroughs uh, and store visits, because we actually are able to track this visit behavior through the Wi-Fi, um, you see a completely different story. While we only spent 40% of our spend on Facebook, 72% of the walkthroughs actually came from Facebook versus only 28% from Instagram, where you spent most of your budget, uh, which means the cost per walkthrough uh, was $1.40 on Facebook and $4 on Instagram. And this is a level of insight that we've seen consistently throughout the space where uh, clicks don't equate to actual in-store visits. And that's why it's important to actually understand and be able to measure visits so that you can optimize your campaigns for future success. And for Mario specifically, again, uh, when we look at the digital team, traditional forms of measure of success would be, hey, how many impressions did we get, how many clicks and how many engagements? But they really didn't have a good pulse on return on ad spend. Now, by actually tying ad exposure to walkthroughs, we were able to help them get a level of visibility that they haven't seen before. So we were able to actually re uh, generate 13,000 lost customer walkthroughs, right? And acquire that at $2.43 per customer. And by connecting with uh, an app like Patronix, we were actually able to tie that to the exact transaction value. So for the first time, you're now able to tie impression to walkthrough to transaction. Uh, and over a 30-day period, we were able to see $15 roughly of revenue, uh, resulting in a six to one return on ad spend. Now, what this means for them was in this single campaign alone, with $16,000, we were able to generate nearly $100,000 for them in revenue within the first 30 days by reacquiring lost customers, which really showed the opportunity uh, to, 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 to generate revenue by knowing your customers and bringing them back in a timely manner. So bring me back labs customers, right? Uh, goal number one. Uh, goal number two, right, is re-engaging those customers and moving them along um, that continuum to go from a last uh, lapsed or lost customer to, to a loyal customer. And this is where Jessica's experience or expertise really comes into play. Um, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Jessica for this next part of the conversation to talk a little bit about how you actually take someone from being a, a, a lost customer to someone who's a, a loyal customer. So Jessica, over to you. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so there are, you know, some ways that you can um, identify when a guest is lapsed, also once they're within your loyalty program. Um, and it's not as straightforward as necessarily um, a certain daytime span. You really want to drill down and see what a guest visit cadence actually looks like. Um, so this is an example of a casual dining restaurant. So we're going to switch gears from uh, Mario's Bakery for this example. Um, and we took a sample of about 3,000 customers at this casual dining restaurant, each of whom visited 12 times a year. Um, so on average, those guests visited about once a month. But when you actually look at how they spread out those visits, um, they're never evenly spaced. So of those 3,000 customers, not a single one visited out like every 30 days. Um, when you look at the visit frequency, we found that on average, um, the guests may have a visit, visit pattern that looks a little bit more like this, uh, where the first blue dot is their first visit during the year. And then each subsequent visit is plotted based on how many days have passed since the previous one. And so there were actually two instances when this guest made two visits within the span of three days, and then another instance when 83 days passed between visits. So suppose that 60 days into that long gap, you thought that this guest had lapsed and therefore sent an offer to entice them to come back. Um, you might have unnecessarily discounted the next visit. And so these are some of the things that you can kind of look at um, to help get those guests back within your loyalty program. 
Great. So, you know, what if there is that long gap between visits? So when we look across that sample of 3,000 customers, um, like I said, it's pretty common to actually have one of those long gaps between visits. Um, so in this case where we were looking at this particular casual dining restaurant, 75% um, of the customers in the sample had at least one gap of 60 days or more. So if you enforce a rule that sent an offer out to customers if they don't visit for 60 days, 75% of the sample group would have received that offer. On the other hand, if you wait out to 120 days, only about 8% of guests would have received the offer. So deciding when to send that lapsed offer to your guests involves weighing out several factors. If you send it too early, you risk a lot of cannibalization, um, but you do address more customers. But if you wait too long, there's a chance that you've already lost them. Um, and this same variation is found whether it's fine dining or quick service concepts. Um, and it holds true for guests with different average frequencies as well. Um, the main point is just that because a guest hasn't visited for longer than normal, it isn't necessarily time to worry um, and send out that offer right away because you might end up sending too rich of an offer when the guest was already likely to come back. Um, of course, there's a certain window of time when it's more effective to engage with guests who have lapsed who, or who may be at risk for lapsing. Um, and we see that at around 80 to 90 days, it becomes less likely that this gap is just normal variation. Um, and since these are guests that typically visit about once per month, that's about three times their average visit frequency. So um, in this example, it's between 80 and 90 days, but if you know the average visit frequency is once per week, then it might be at three weeks, depending on the different concept of restaurant. So what we tend to recommend is a two-tier approach. Um, we recommend that your first offer be sent at a point that's between two to three times the average visit frequency. Um, so for this example, again, if they visit every 30 days, um, your first lapsed offer should be between 60 to 90 days of inactivity. And we also suggest that your first offer be valued at about 33% of average per person spend. So if a guest typically spends $12, um, you should make that offer around $4. And it can be in terms of a cash off in dollars amount off a total, um, you know, $5 off your order, or it could be in the form of a free menu item. So a free um, dessert or free appetizer. Your second offer should go out between four to five times the average frequency. And this offer should be larger. This is your last effort to really drag that guest back in. And that should be at about 50% of average per person spend. Um, and we suggest no strings attached type offers. Um, we also recommend obviously holding out a control group as well when trying lapsed offers so you can measure the impact of your campaign um, and make sure that that control group has a sufficient sample size as well. Um, we don't recommend point offers for lapsed guests, although those can be effective for retaining your active members. So when we look at this example of this casual dining restaurant where um, they were looking at guests that visited 12 times a year, um, this customer decided that they wanted to target first their high frequency guests. Um, and these were guests that hadn't visited within the past 30 to 37 days. Um, and since they were such high frequency guests, um, this was cause for alarm and this client wanted to reach out to them um, before it got a chance to go any further. And so they sent out a $3 off offer only to those high frequency customers. And as you can see here, the target group did slightly better than the control group, but there wasn't a big change in behavior for those guests. Um, it's almost as likely that they would have come in even without the offer. Um, so tying it back to the previous example with Mario's Bakery, um, that's a great time to target them with information about new menu items, um, because that might be enough to get them back in without actually sending a um, dollar off offer, offer at that point. And then when we look at the first tiered offer, um, so again, these are guests that visit 12 times a year. Um, so they actually chose to go um, for people who hadn't visited between 90 to 97 days, which is right about that three times their average visit frequency. And in this example, they sent a $5 off offer to these guests. Um, so unlike the first offer, which was just for high frequency customers, um, now this was for any customer that had not visited within that 90 to 97 days. And they sent a $5 off offer, um, which for this chain is about, again, 33% off of their regular spend. Um, so now you can start to see a lift among the target group, which was about 17% lift in visits. 
Um, so this did actually have a positive impact of bringing those guests back in um, and really enticing them to enjoy this casual dining chain again. And then next, when you look at the second tiered offer, um, this is actually a little bit further out than we would typically advise. They waited to see guests who had not visited um, between 201 to 217 days, um, which is closer to actually seven times the average visit frequency. Um, but even with that long of a gap, it still shows that you can get those guests back with a valuable offer. Um, so this was sent to all of those guests for $10 off their purchase. And the lift in this group is even higher. Um, so it is a richer reward, um, but when somebody hasn't visited your brand for you know, seven times the average frequency, it might be worth it if you really want to bring them back. And you can see a lift in visits um, of 60% from this target group as well. So um, even though more time has passed, it's, you can still get them back if you send them the right offer at that time. So um, when is the right time to engage with the guests in your program that you think might be lapsed or at risk of lapsing? Um, you don't have to make it a single shot opportunity. So as we can see here, you know, uh, those people that didn't respond during the 90 to 97 day promo, um, you can still get them back when you do your second tiered approach. Uh, you know, there's three offers of progressively increasing values that are delivered to these guests once, th once they reach that threshold of days since their last visit. Um, so while you think these guests might be gone or might be ghosting you, sending them this valuable offer can still get them back. So they're not lost for good yet. Great. So what's also um, good to work towards is um, knowing who your guests are on a more individualized concept. So this was kind of um, broadly guests who hadn't visited um, or rather who visit 12 times per year, but refining your lapse guest strategy by further segmenting those guests according to visit frequency and moving closer and closer to a more individualized definition of lapse guests can also further minimize the discounts you send and also maximize the impact of these lapse guest campaigns. Uh, the more you know about these guests will not only help you know when they've lapsed, but you'll also know more about what offers they respond to and what resonates best with them. Um, if one of your potentially lapsed guests never orders dessert, sending them a free dessert offer is not going to be what resonates most with them, and that's not going to be what drags them back um, into your doors. So um, you want to know, you know, what their order history looks like and really get to know them um, completely as a guest um, so you can pick the right offers to send as well. So once you move those lapsed guests back into your core base of active regular customers, you can continue to engage with them in a lot of different ways to increase their visit frequency. Um, so we've worked with some of our customers on one-to-one -one visit challenges, where you might give a guest who visits one to two times per week a challenge to get them to that third visit, and guests that visit five times a week something to get them to that sixth or seventh. So once you move them from lapsed into your core customer base, um, you have a lot more options at your disposal for ways that you can interact with them and get them re-engaged in your program um, that don't always necessarily involve those rich rewards that you're doing to get them back when you're, they're in danger of lapsing. And so one thing you can do is target your infrequent guests with visit challenges. Um, so this is infrequent rather than lapse. So maybe it's someone um, who only visits you know, three times a year for that casual restaurant chain or maybe only four times a year. Um, and so this is something a different client of ours did um, for their infrequent guests. Um, this pro promotion was targeted only to infrequent loyalty program members. And during the promotion month, guests received loyalty points when they visited, um, but the number increased each time as a multiplier. So if you visited once, you earned 50 points. If you visited twice, that was 100 points. Um, three times, 150 points. Um, you guys get the idea there. Um, but customers loved earning those extra points. So the promotion actually led to a 54% boost in visit rates and a 42% rise in monthly revenue from that segment. And even better, that increase in visits didn't stop during the promotion month. The revenue from this customer segment lifted 27% the month following the promotion. Um, because if you think about it, you know, people are earning all those extra points, they're gonna get closer to the rewards, and then they're going to come back in again to redeem their rewards. So 
um, we were able to see that the boost didn't only happen during the promotion month, but there was also a spillover into the months following. So getting those lapsed guests back into your active pool allows you to run promotions like this, where you can do points instead of dollars um, and you know, really increase your visits without um, necessarily giving out offers as well. Jessica, thanks. I'm just going to quickly sum up the conversation and I want to get to some, some Q&A. We've, we've had some really good questions come in and we've got five or ten minutes left. So I want to um, get to as many questions as we can. But just to quickly um, sum up the conversation, right, uh, to understand and bring back lapsed customers, lesson number one, as Don pointed out at the beginning of, of the conversation, is that you need to understand visit behavior. You need to be able to distinguish a lapsed customer from, from the rest of your customers. Once you understand who is lapsed and you know something about their visit behavior, then aligning the, um, the offer and directing the communication in a way that's very targeted are, are the keys to making sure you're being as efficient as possible with the communication and with the offers. Using some kind of measurement, uh, Don was talking about measuring walkthroughs as, a, as an important way of doing it, but having some way to close the loop and understand the performance of these different campaigns you're running is really key in order to continuously improve your outbound um, communication efforts and bringing back lost guests and keeping them coming back. And then Jessica has shown us some um, really sophisticated ways that you can, once you bring a customer back, move them from a lapsed or lost customer into um, a customer that returns again and again through uh, engagement and loyalty programs. So let's move on to some Q&A. Like I said, we've got a bunch of good questions. We'll get to as many of them as I can. Dom and Jessica, I encourage you guys to be thorough, be brief. Let's see how many of these we can get through. Um, the first question I want to get to, um, this is about using uh, using loyalty apps as a way to bring customers back. So I mean, this is a question that maybe you both want to address, but Tom, let's start with you. Are there, can you recommend good ways to get customers to install loyalty apps? I know a lot of brands invest an awful lot in these apps and then don't see them necessarily get used all that much. Yeah, totally. That's a great question because, you know, Jessica talked about all these great ways of engaging your customers. Um, through the app once you bring them back from lost to well, but the question is how do you even get these folks on these platforms in the first place? And now I think that's that's where you can actually um, gain a lot of synergies between stitching uh, multiple customer acquisition sources together. So for example, one thing that we do a lot with a lot of our clients at Zenreach is we utilize the Wi-Fi to help them capture all these customer contacts initially. And then once they're ready to be uh, upsold into the loyalty app, we actually feed those into a specific audience and uh, get them to download the loyalty app for that organization. Uh, and that's you know, a good way to leverage both data sources in order to feed your customers from a first time customer um, detected through the Wi-Fi into a loyalty app like Patriotix. Yeah, and then I can tackle this a little bit as well. Um, so I think there's two things at play here. Um, I think if you're interested in getting people into your loyalty program, um, that shouldn't necessarily mean that they need to download an app. So having a few different ways where people can interact with the loyalty, whether it's um, providing a phone number at checkout or um, you know identifying themselves by email address or even if it's a physical card, um, sometimes it's helpful to have multiple methods also um, outside of necessarily an app. Um, we do find it's very people download a lot of apps, but being an app that people keep on their phones is a little bit more challenging. Um, so if you are interested in making your mobile app one that people want to keep, um, especially depending on what type of business you are, but we find this is very effective um, with some coffee chains or high frequency type uh, locations. Um, you can offer different things on there like stored value. Um, so, you know, you see this at a lot of coffee chains where you um, have gift cards that you can keep loaded right within the app and earn rewards um, as you pay with that method. So combining a payment method along with your loyalty app um, is also helpful to make it convenient for guests because they don't have to think about a different method of payment as well. But that will also um, help to keep your app um, active on their phone as well. Thanks, Jessica. Hey, while while you're talking, Jessica, I'd like to direct the next question to you. You, you talked about different kinds of offers, points, uh, discounts, free menu items. Um, can you provide some some easy advice on 
the best offers for bringing back laps customers? Yeah, so we advise um, not to use points for laps customers. Uh, point offers are great for your active members. So once you pull them back from being lapsed, um, then absolutely use points. Um, but if you think about it, if somebody's on the brink of never returning uh, to your business and you offer them points, it's like, eh, like what does that do for you immediately? It's, it's the promise that with three more visits, you'll earn a reward. But if you're not sure if you're going to make one more visit, um, that doesn't really do anything for you. So to get back laps, customers it makes a lot more sense and we see the best results um, to do either like I said a dollar off or a free promotion um, and kind of again if you get to more of that one-to-one -one level of knowing your guests you'll know whether um, a free item or a dollar off will resonate with them more based on their interactions with your brand in the past um, so kind of using some machine learning to figure out which offer is also going to be the most effective comes into play here um, but I would stay away from points um, as far as your lapse guests are concerned Thanks, Jessica. And let me turn one to you, Dom, a really practical one, right? People tend to get new phones at least every couple of years. Um, if you're using the phone as the device that's attached to an identity, right, or a person, uh, what, do you, what do you do when somebody gets a new phone? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. Um, so yeah, the, the reality is people do get new devices. Now, the thing that a lot of Wi-Fi technology providers are able to do is actually stitch identities across different devices and refresh that identity when a new device comes into play. Um, so the constant here really is the contact information, right? Which is the email identifier. So Mike, say you got a new phone and you went back into Mario's, we would ask you for your email again and you would put in your email there and then we would then associate this new device with that identity as well. So you get a constant view of the customer as they go switching onto new devices. Thank you. And um, one way to know that people are paying attention to presentations when they ask you questions about your research. Um, so Jessica, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the details of the research that you were presenting, but a couple of people have asked about the control group that was used mm -hmm. for the Patronics data that you were sharing. Can you explain a little bit about the control group? Yes. So as far as I understand um, the research when it was done, the control group did not receive any offer um, during that point. So in some of those cases um, where, um, let's say it was a long period of time, um, some of those guests are still going to come back in anyway, just naturally. Um, like I said, maybe they weren't technically lapsed. Maybe it was just the natural cadence of their visits that took them um, you know, 90 to 97 days before they came back. So some of them are going to come back naturally. And so in the control group, those visits that you're seeing, um, they didn't get sent any offer. Um, that was just kind of the natural um, cadence of their visits led them to come back again without the offer. Thanks, Jessica. We're, we're running really short on time. I think we've got time for one more. And um, here's an interesting question, Dom, that I want to direct to you. You know, with GDPR and a lot of pending legislation here in the U.S. Um, with regard to privacy, obviously collecting information, identifiable information, is something that businesses are getting more and more aware of and becoming more and more sensitive to. Um, so uh, I, I'm just, the, the question is kind of broadly, how, how, how does GDPR and privacy regulation um, affect practices like the ones that you're talking about? Yeah, that's a really important question in today's world, Mike. And I think the, the so when you think about GDPR, the main thing is to be able to collect customer information in an opt-in way so that you're getting first party data. And the second piece is to be able to give customers control of their data and visibility, right? And you know, that's something that, you know, for example, Wi-Fi provider like us is really, uh, is really important to us and the, i think the main thing here is when you think about the methods i talked about before they're all opt-in where the customer is actually receiving something in return there's a value exchange as well which prompts them to opt in so for wi-fi it'd be the free wi-fi and they're opting into these messages in which they can unsubscribe at any time and then the second piece is with these platforms we also also provide them with visibility into what types of data we have uh, on them and how we might be using that targeting uh, to give customers control of how they want to be targeted 
Thanks, Thanks Tom. We're, we're up against time, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Dom and Jessica, I really appreciate you guys spending some time with us today and um, sharing a bit about what you've learned about bringing back lapsed customers and keeping them coming back. And uh, for everybody in the audience, thanks for spending a little time with us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. As I said at the top, we've recorded the session and we'll be sharing that with everyone that's registered. We'll also let you know through that communication how you can get a hold of us with any follow-up questions that you might have, which we'd be happy to answer. So thank you again for joining. Look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Uh, with that, we're going to sign off. Thanks. Bye-bye.